Thank you very much for attending. I know uh, your time is very valuable, and I always value when people decide to take their time and listen to me uh, present. <clears throat> so uh, the talk today is, yes, reactive DDD, or domain-driven design. Um, and so where do the two ideas, the two concepts, approaches to software development overlap? Um, I think that today we're in a bit of a crisis in terms of the way that software is designed, the way it's implemented. And uh, in my experience over you know, many years of software development, I've found that it really doesn't have to be uh, the way that things are done today. And uh, so you know, I want to encourage you to, to take uh, carefully and, and consider uh, the information that I'm going to share with you and give it a try. It's not, um, it's not difficult. You can, um, it, it, is, it is emphasizing simplicity and sometimes simplistic or simple doesn't mean easy, but I don't think that it's overly complex to try to um, use these approaches. So, Okay, well, so I think where most of us are or have been for a long time is in this mode. This is a, a uh, blocking mode where, as you see, there's a client and a server. Now, when, I, when I'm discussing these two concepts, I'm not talking about a remote client and a remote server. I'm talking about two objects, okay? And uh, as Rebecca Werfsbrock has pointed out in, in her writings about um, responsibility-driven design or development. Um, you know, we talk about an object that provides a service as uh, a server object and a client that uses that service or consumes that service as a client object. And so what happens when this client requests a service of the server? Typically, it blocks. Okay, this is no doubt what you learned uh, whenever you started programming, uh, in whatever phase of your career, you probably have always been working with blocking. And this, generally speaking, is not well suited on the large scale for the kinds of systems and the kinds of uh, infrastructures that we work on these days. Um, also, um, th this happens during when we request a behavior of an object, and sometimes even requesting behavior is uh, something that's rarely done these days, and I'll show you why I say that in a moment. But um, the, the HTTP request response is often a blocking operation where a remote client will make a REST request to a remote server service, and essentially the request will block until a response is received. But sometimes that's quite a, um, a delayed or latent process. And then, of course, when we write something to the database or read something from the database, very often our uh, connections to the database are synchronous. And you might add more to that. Now, there is a, um, an improvement today in that some of the uh, frameworks or, or web servers or so forth that, that are available are providing some asynchronicity or asynchrony to their request response um, behavior. And, and also, you can get asynchronous database connections. So it's not you know, entirely a, a loss. Um, today, but it's still not a widespread situation. The other problem that we have today is largely software is implemented using an anemic domain model. This is where uh, essentially a domain object, or what people liberally call domain object, really has no behavior. It just has 
data settings on it. So you can, in Java, for example, call set something, set something else, and, and that's sort of seen as the, the way that um, a service communicates with the domain object. This is problematic, and hopefully I can show you that, you know, when you consider a behavior-rich domain object, there's actually much less code overall in a behavior-rich domain object than there is in an anemic object. And you can test the behavior-rich object, whereas testing an anemic object is quite difficult. Imagine that um, you know, there aren't just these, what, seven attributes on this Java object that's marked as an entity. It's annotated as an entity, and it has an ID column, and and uh, s other columns. So essentially what we're doing with this object is we're just using it to map data into a relational database table, into a row. And that is very often how software is being designed these days. I would say, you know, almost, you know, I, not 100%, but uh, it's a very probably high number in, in the 90s. Uh, percent of, of times software is being developed this way. Now imagine that this object has 25 string attributes on it. Think of all the possible ways that a client could set data on this object incorrectly. How do you test that the client is not only perhaps setting the correct attributes, but not setting the incorrect attributes? You could probably write 100 different tests and not be confident that you've covered all the cases, nor is it really necessary if you're using a rich behavior. I think that where we are headed today is a message-driven uh, architecture, a message-driven systems, message-driven domain models even. And I think that this is... Um, highly necessary because most of the software that we see in, you know, in the open today and in the wild is blocking. It's not using processors to uh, the extent that they can be used. And message-driven, even at the object level, can help to uh, improve the overall throughput of the system because all cores on a given server can be used uh, to a very high percentage of their capacity. And this even includes event-driven, so any kind of event can also serve as a message, but this is where we actually create a concept in our domain model that represents a happening that we care about, and that happening is recorded as a fact. And that fact can be saved into a data source, and that fact can then be um, basically published out or relayed to or broadcast to other uh, subsystems because they have some interest in it. And what you see here is not just an event-driven um, architecture, but it's also a reactive architecture because, as you can see, the, the um, controller on the left-hand side is sending a command message to what in domain-driven design we might call an aggregate. It's basically an entity that has a very certain transactional boundary. And that command can then be processed, and if accepted, an event is emitted. That event can be persisted and even represent the, uh, help to represent the entire state of the aggregate or entity. And then notice how the commands are actually being queued at the bottom. So this is introducing the idea of an actor. This is uh, using the actor model. So this is where command one, two, three, and four are being sequentially um, processed by the actor or this aggregate, this entity, but they're only being processed uh, one at a time in the order in which they occurred, which means there's a non-blocking um, and, and, and non-locking kind of environment where the actor doesn't have to wor worry about concurrency um, violations. 
Now, I want to tell you a story. Um, is, it, is this sort of an odd-looking coffee mug to you? Yeah. So in, uh, I think it was early 1987, I was asked to co-author a book called, uh, entitled The Advanced C Programmer's Guide to OS 2. And Microsoft Press was the publisher. <laughs> if you know anything about OS 2, well, that explains a lot. But um, ha how many here have ever wanted to scare Bill Gates? Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying, I'm, you know, here's what happened, right? I'm writing this book and I came up with this library, a message-based library that was using the OS2 um, IPC facilities. And um, what I did is I created a character mode desktop um, API, basically, that sat on top of the uh, Microsoft or, or, you know, the OS2 API. And it handled full windowing with asynchronous um, control. And all the windows actually you know, weren't going through a processing loop, but actually reactive to um, the fact that you know, a clock updated or reacting to anything. And with, without dragging this out further, um, basically, when Bill Gates found out about what I did, he said, shut it down. <laughs> it, uh, it might compete with Presentation Manager. So my days with reactive and messaging and so forth goes quite a ways, ways back. And it proves that um, you can scare people when you do the things that you want to do. So um, OK, so one of the maybe problems that we face with reactive today is that sometimes the reactive platform itself requires us to, if you're optimally using the reactive platform, to even switch languages that you're using. Um, can you model with fluency in that reactive system or platform? Uh, do you have type safety in that platform? Is it testable? type safety? Is it testable model fluency? And so what I suggest is don't give up the, the languages. For example, if you're working in Java on a regular basis, you don't have to give up Java to get uh, reactive benefits. So when I talk about reactive DDD, this is what I'm referring to. And you probably you know, could recognize these green uh, blobs as, as uh, now, let's say microservices. You might immediately kind of question that and say, well, there are too many entities in that for it to be a microservice. Well, it depends on your definition of microservice. What I'm talking about here is um, a microservice as a domain-driven design-bounded context, which is not a monolith, but it's also, generally speaking, not a single entity type. Okay? So a relatively small model that is um, bounded away from other models because it has a specific set of, of language drivers, okay? Uh, as in human language drivers, business language drivers that say, okay, the, the bounded context on the far right and the bounded context on the far left speak different languages. And even if they use the same words, um, they can have subtle or entirely different meanings for those words so, um, and behaviors for that matter. So this is what I'm referring to with reactive DDD. And you see how I have a command model and a query model that are what we would say segregated from each other. This is talking about the, the CQRS pattern. It doesn't mean, though, that to have a reactive DDD um, uh, ecosystem with microservices that you must use the CQRS pattern, but uh, we'll find in a few moments that this can be very handy to use. So what is fluent? You know, I, I don't know how well you can see this definition from the back, but um, fluent is a way of articulately expressing yourself. And I really have to reiterate that by setting data on entities, you are not conveying the intention of why you are doing that. Okay. 
So just think about having an, an anemic entity that has, um, you know, whatever, 25 different setter methods on it. Well, maybe not so many, but in any case, you set five of those attributes through a setter method. What does that mean? Do you require your client to understand what that means? In essence, what you're doing is you're putting the burden of uh, the client in conforming to your data model rather than the client understanding what the business language is. So when I talk about Fluent, I'm talking about potentially creating a protocol such as this one, a progress protocol. And uh, um, actually, that's a mistake. That should say proposal. <laughs> in case you're editing my slides. Um, and the proposal has the protocol of you can submit um, a proposal for a client with some expectations. Um, you also have in the protocol that the pricing set by the expectations of the client or defined by that in the proposal is deny pricing or it could be verify pricing, so the pricing is accepted. If it's deny pricing, then we're going to provide a suggested price as a money. So notice how this is actually a fluent model. You are expressing the intent of the operations that are being performed on uh, this domain object. Okay, so it's fluent. We can say proposal dot submit for client expectations. D don't you just like how that rolls off my tongue? May maybe if you just said it under your breath, you go, "Wow, that just that says it all, doesn't it?" It's it's a proposal submitted for client expectations. Yeah, everybody knows exactly what we're doing, right? So that's fluent. And notice, you know, I, I tweeted about this last night. Um, there's no semicolon in this language. Uh, that's a trick, there is. It's Java, but I've put the semicolon on column 192. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm emulating a semicolonless language. Um, now, what's interesting too is, not only can I have fluency in the domain model itself, but what if I could have fluency in the library or the tool set that I'm using? For example, if I have a stage where actors are playing, if I could say stage actor of um, a user from a user ID and then into, so I'm going to take that user and I'm going to now use another actor, the user actor that I just looked up, but I didn't just look it up. It was looked up asynchronously and therefore I don't know when that user may or may not be found, but when it is, then I can ask the user to, in essence, convey a new contact onto the user, um, new contact information for that user. And when that is finally done, I will and then consume so I can use a RESTful response to um, respond and OK with the serialized user. All right, so there's an idea of, of fluency in the library itself. Now. Imagine this, um, oh, and I forgot to mention, why, why is the otherwise consume there? Well, this is in case the user wasn't found, what do you want to do in that case? Otherwise consume, and we then answer a response of not found in our rest response, okay? So imagine being able to have fluency both in your API and in your domain model. It just sounds the way things work. The question is, is this reactive? Um, yes, it is reactive because there's, you know, this sort of invisible thing happening behind the scenes. When I, as we would say in, in Java normally, invoke this method, when I invoke this method, this submit for method is not just an invocation on 
the proposal actor itself. Instead, that submit for invocation is reified into a message that is then delivered asynchronously to um, the proposal, which is an actor that is receiving uh, messages asynchronously. And so this is a command kind of message. We're saying it's an imperative. We're saying do this, all right? So in fact, it is reactive, and yet you don't have to know intuitively as the, as the client that you are working in a reactive environment other than the fact that as soon as you submit for, you get control back. And it means that that actor will not um, have an immediate response for you. So what does, that, what does that mean? Well, that's why we have this um, and then consume kind of uh, um, method where we can consume the result if there is a result afterwards or we get a complete, essentially another name for a future um, that, that causes this reactive response to be asynchronous and you can deal with it asynchronously. Type safe, well, I think this is type safe. So we're going to uh, use this proposal to submit for a client from a client ID and it has the expectations of summary, description, keywords, completed by steps and a price. So not only is this fluent and expressive, but it's type safe. And what we're leveraging here are what, are what are called value objects to express our ubiquitous language of domain-driven design, um, but, but also even at the creational uh, point of view, we're doing that very fluently. And it's type safe at every single attribute. So a summary has a specific type. And you know, if you've ever seen one of these APIs that has that where in, into a service method you have to pass um, maybe five to 25 string parameters, you know, in one single method invocation, how do you get the order of those parameters correct? I, I you know, I mean, I think it takes a genius to remember, you know, just the order that those parameters are, are in or a very tired set of eyes. You know, how do you actually accomplish that? So type safety is an important thing. However, because actors work in a very um, you know, re reactive or asynchronous way, how do we know when the command will be fulfilled? Was it fulfilled? When does the event get emitted? Has it been permanently persisted to a data source? So when we go asynchronous, concurrent, parallel, we are introducing uncertainty. And the uncertainty is even introduced um, at the entire system level. So I was talking about the uncertainty that occurs inside a single bounded context or a microservice with that example of an actor, but externally too, how are these events, for example, consumed around the entire system for a, a full system solution? There's uncertainty here. How do we deal with that? How do we model it? Well, I'm gonna uh, talk about that. So here we have a proposal and notice that this proposal implements the proposal protocol. Okay, so this is the protocol that this proposal understands, and I showed you a few slides ago what that protocol is. And uh, we happen to be an event-sourced kind of entity, so we're using event sourcing, and if, if you don't know about that, I, I won't go into it a lot here, but you can look it up. It's basically where um, the, the events that get emitted from this proposal collectively and in order represent the entire state of this proposal entity that, that has been built up over time. So notice that we have uh, two attributes, client and expectations. These are the ones that have been um, 
put into our proposal through the submit for uh, fluent method. But how is it that we deal with the uncertainty in this proposal? Well, we can use a progress. What is a progress? This was not passed in by the client, but rather it's an internal um, object that we're going to, to transition as we know more, as we learn more about what has happened to this entity. So, if, for example, if we, uh, I hate to roll back, but just to, just to make a point, when the proposal is submitted, eventually we will get, for example, a, um, a deny pricing or a verified pricing because this proposal has some pricing information in it and that will be verified by another bounded context because this is uh, a pricing service and that verification is then later communicated and when it is finally communicated, um, we're going to, to transition this progress step by step. Okay, so focus in on the progress, and if we look in at the progress, this is actually a value object, and what we're going to do when uh, the progress is verified for pricing, this is um, a side effect free behavior, which means it, it's using roughly a, a functional approach, which says we're not going to modify the progress in place, what we're actually going to do is return a new progress that is created with the current state of this progress and in addition to it, uh, specification of, of pricing verified. Now, this proposal entity can know its current progress. It knows uh, when it has completed a certain set of steps or when some are incomplete and therefore this modeling um, technique helps us to deal with or model the uncertainty. So you notice what we're actually doing is we are not trying to model the uncertainty out at the infrastructure level and try to make everything look synchronous and everything look ordered and everything look, you know, um, um, non, non duplicated and deduplicated and so forth. What, what we're actually doing is we're saying, okay, we work in a distributed environment. We are going to model this for the distributed nature of our service. And as we do, we're going to name something that is not necessarily you know, part of the original idea of a, of a proposal, and yet we need to. And so it's not necessarily the natural model or the real world model, but it is a useful model, right? And that is the goal of a model. As we know, you know it's been said uh, time and again that all models are wrong, some are useful, and that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so I've been touching a little bit on microservices and everybody wants to go microservices, but what is a microservice anyway? And I have a certain definition that I promote and I don't stand alone on this idea, although you know, you're free to examine the other approaches and, and determine um, you know, what, what you like. So defining though the size of a microservice can be a pretty important thing. So if everybody else wants to go microservices, that means we want to go microservices. And just for what it's worth, <clears throat> this is what the business wants, right? And it's not a joke. I mean, you know, if you're working for a profitable organization, and even nonprofit organizations have to be profitable to exist, um, they want this. But you know what your job is? Your job is to convince them that this is what they want. Okay. Ah, oh, come on, you didn't get that? <laughs> I worked hard for that. Okay, these are microservices, right? The other is what? A big ball of mud. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do is define, get some definitions here. What is a microservice? Legacy, this is legacy. Why do I say this is legacy? Because it makes money. If it didn't make money, it would be unplugged, hopefully, right? The business would know better. Oh man, we're just dragging this thing around wherever we go. Now we need to go to the cloud. It's not making any money. Oh, but let's port it anyway. You know, let's, let's lift and shift anyway, right? Um, no, so that's what legacy means. Oh, but this is legacy too. 
What's the difference? Monolith. You know, I, I hear people say monolith, and I just wish that they would sort of clarify, because I think monolith is used generally in a very negative connotation. Not always, but generally what they're talking about when they say monolith is a big ball of mud. This is something that, you know, you touch something over here and something way over here breaks and you have no explanation until maybe lots of research is done and you have no idea. But this is actually a well-modularized monolith. And so you could do a lot worse than a monolith. This may not scale or perform the way that you want it to um, or need it to, I should say, but, you know, it's a lot easier to, to reason about this kind of monolith. And so you can imagine where you are using packages or namespaces or whatever uh, sort of language that you're using to separate out within a, within a single um, you know, jar file the different modules. And as I'll show you in a moment, there's a good hint to what these modules might be. But I think that this is probably what most people are referring to when they talk about a legacy monolith, I think they really mean the big ball of mud. And again, this is where things are so tangled, um, so ridiculous. I, I have a colleague here and friend, uh, you know, I, I, uh, we've, we've worked together from time to time and I remember I tell this story often and, and we roll out a, uh, or the, his team of architects roll out this UML diagram that I'm pretty sure Tom, that that UML diagram was um, 20 feet long, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. But, you know, you could touch something over here in that, you know, logically shown on the UML diagram that's real code running that could break something over here and you had no idea why. And I'm not saying that that was Tom's fault, it wasn't. <laughs> um, but that's, I think, you know, what, what we're talking about when we say monolith often. A microservice, what is a microservice, okay? Some people say it's 100 lines of code. And, you know, I, uh, frankly, I think the person who takes credit for the term microservice um, and, and the conceptualizing of microservice refers to a microservice as basically 100 lines of code. But should it be 400 instead, would that be good? Um, maybe a thousand lines of code, is that a good microservice? I mean, if you say 400 and it's 450 lines, does that make it a bad microservice? I, you know, I don't know, but um, here's what happens with that 100 line microservice is you start out off with, you know, and basically these are just entities, right? So each microservice has a single entity type in it, and, or at, at most a single entity type. And all of these entities, when something happens to them, they, they publish a message of some kind to a topic, let's say that's Kafka, and then any other microservice that is dependent on that message being po um, sent through Kafka is consuming that, and now that you know, we have a microservices architecture, the problem with this is not so much right now today, as I see this, the problem happens over time. And this is what happens. We start thinking about, okay, now, that service A and service Z did this for it. Does service A still depend on service Z? Or maybe service Z isn't even relevant anymore. Could we unplug it? Oh, man, this is hard, you know? Now, I know that things are improving with with uh, service meshes and the kind of uh, logging that's going on. But just ask yourself how long you could survive that kind of situation. Um, I know I, I wouldn't want to, okay? That's all that I'll say. I can't speak for you. And so what, what some have done is they've said, hey, I got the solution, right? Um, it only costs $400 a month to keep one of those microservices running. Let's just keep it running. We'll never unplug it. That way we don't need to know um, what depends on it or if it still does anything relevant. And so this is what we end up with over time, right? And, and, you know, and, and so you might say, well, that, that was unfair to draw all of those little microservices as 
a big ball of mud, but I think, by my definition, this is just a distributed big ball of mud because you don't understand it in the same way that you don't understand the monolithic big ball of mud. And when you're afraid to unplug something because you don't have any idea if it's still relevant, I don't know, but I think I'd be worried about that. Okay, whether it's $400 a month or not, because this is what it amounts to, right? $400 a month and it keeps growing. And so what is a complex system? Now, I'm not saying you would necessarily create 2 million or 5 million lines of code purely through microservices, but if you did, just think about it from this aspect, right? 2 million lines of code system, that's 20,000 microservices at $400 a month, that's $8 million a month, $96 million a year, or let's say we're up to 5 million, lines of code, that's 50,000 microservices. So all that I'm saying here is before you jump down that path, think about it, okay? And then consider that a bounded context as a microservice may be the first best step for you. This is again, not a monolith, but it's not as small as a single entity type either. And can we still talk to Kafka topics or through Kafka topics? Sure, why not? But now, with roughly the same number of entities involved that we had in, in the first rendition of that distributed big ball of mud, you know, what we're talking about is seven um, uh, bounded contexts or microservices rather than dozens of them and growing. So one of our uh, things that we need to accomplish is that we have to try to achieve strategic business advantage. And that is really the big job that DDD tries, tries to solve or is intended to solve. Um, and if you look here and you, you go back to, in your mind to that anemic client model, right? That anemic client model could be replaced with just a few methods, which is I can set a new address on that anemic model. I can set a new telephone number on that anemic model. It's fluent, it's explicit. The intention is revealed through the interface itself, but then notice this additional method, relocate to. This is also changing the address, but it has a different use case. And the use case is that if this client has just purchased something on our e-commerce system or proposed a, a job request that some worker is going to consume, and they said, oh, I just moved house, right? I need to change my address. And they changed the address. Now all downstream concerns can be aware that this client's address has changed because this domain event is being sent out through um, uh, to, to other microservices or bounded contexts who need to know this, who need to consume that nugget of factual knowledge that says, ah, we need to react to this. This is a reactive system. Okay? And notice that this client is now testable. Okay? And look, just a couple lines of code uh, relocate to, yes, indeed, is setting an address value object, but it's also emitting an event client relocated. This is how the downstream knows. And you can imagine that just in one or two tests here, test that client relocates, right? We can assert that the client relocates in the way that we expect it to, and we can even assert that the, that the uh, domain event was emitted as part of the test acceptance. So now if you go back in your mind to that, that uh, monolith that was a well-structured or modularized monolith, what if each of those were a bounded context? I just wanna make that point because we're going into a more complicated or complex part of this story. And that's how do we get from there to there? Well, if you have a monolith that is well-modularized as bounded context, getting to microservices can be a matter of breaking those apart. They should already be very loosely coupled, as you see from 
the interfaces between those bounded contexts or those modules, it's already loosely coupled. And so what we're going to do is incur some network overhead, lat latency, and the uncertainty of you know, network partitions and, and whatever it happens to be. And um, so, but, but think about how much easier that is than this, right? Now, how do you get from the big ball of mud to one of these? Very, very carefully. Okay, sometimes there are, um, you know, these unavoidable situations like COBOL. COBOL happens, you know? And it, and man, it happened in a big way. But the, the, one of the big problems with COBOL is you can no longer hire COBOL programmers. And, and companies are trying to hire them back as, cons, you know, contractors out of retirement to maintain their systems, okay? So when, you get, when you're in that situation or another sort of, you know, very languishing technology or product that, that you're leveraging for your applications and services, you gotta get out of there, right? But if you're, say, using Java for the big ball of mud or another um, currently supported and well-supported language and, and platform, you know, you, you kind of have to tackle this like, um, you know, one bite at a time. And, and the one bite at a time means that it's change-driven, value-driven, test-driven. So you don't just dive in and say, hey, manager, you know, I, you know, our team needs like three months to turn this uh, monolith into microservices. Now, I, Andrew just said it took them 18 months to do that at Hulu, right? So be careful about saying something like three months. But whatever number of months it takes, you're probably better off trying to turn the big ball of mud first into a modularized monolith and then taking the steps over here. Because you can get away with it when the company, when the business says, this needs to be done, okay? Um, but another solution to this, when you really have to take the big step of let's get out of here now, right, is an event-driven approach. And this is where you can strangle the big ball of mud one microservice at a time, and this is where basically, you know, there are a few approaches to this. One approach is use triggers. Put triggers in your database that whenever a, a row is written into a table, uh, whether that's created or updated, you can cause a trigger to raise an event. And this is not the most explicit event because it's sort of a little bit hidden, but uh, where that happens, but it's an event, and the microservice uh, strangulation can now start to consume those events, but notice that this microservice has to um, talk back with events to the big ball of mud, because if the user is using it directly, the big ball of mud needs to know what happened over there, because you can't entirely cut off every single client all at once, it just doesn't work that way, right? So it's strangling, but it's, you know, like one microservice at a time. Another way to accomplish this is through um, a product called Debezium. It's an open source uh, product that works with MySQL, Postgres, and, and maybe a few other databases. And uh, it doesn't currently support Oracle, so you can use Oracle's Golden Gate. But this is basically a database commit log tailor that that allows you to, in essence, pick off um, you know, commits and turn those into events. And you accomplish the same thing, but without triggers. And, and that's a lot nicer approach to, to do if you can. But I just want to, to, re, to make a statement here that I don't think that publish any events to the outside world long term through this kind of solution is the right way to go but it's a tool for the job that probably works or, or would work well with a strangler approach, but I don't think that you want to design your new bounded context to publish events out to a, a, you know, a topic or something by using an event log like this. 
Restructuring, this is a different approach. It's not really strangling. It is in a way, but what you're going to uh, attempt to do is potentially find as many entities as you can that can just represent the things that happen in the domain model. Break those away, restructure them, and now use that database commit log to project into a query model, which is used for your user interface. Problem? Yes. Well, at least challenge, and that is that the command model and the query model are eventually consistent. But it could be that you'll take more of the hit in the UI than in the application. So that's another consideration. Um, and then as you sort of, you know, deconstruct that monolith little by little, you can um, talk to the big ball of mud primarily through the command model and the query model and, um, you know, uh, scale out your microservices a lot better than they were. And ultimately, this is sort of where we want to end up, right? We want to have the microservices as bounded context, but I just have to say, this is hard, okay? You, you really can't just um, jump into this and say, ah, oh, you know, again, we're gonna be done in, in a few months. It's hard work, but I think as somebody said, sticking with the other way is even harder, right? So, um, and th this, you know, I just wanted to kind of wrap up with a few thoughts about why reactive from maybe a completely different viewpoint. How many here are, you know, okay, almost nobody wanted to scare Bill Gates, but who here is, is concerned about the ecology, you know, our environment? Anybody? Yeah. Could I just mention cryptocurrency? More hands now? So Dave Farley recently tweeted that, you know, most industries would never tolerate a 50% you know, loss of efficiency for ease of use, and yet software developers do this all the time. And he said, anyone who does that is developing weird software. And then our Vlingo platform tweeted uh, you know, Donald Knuth saying, yeah, that's right. In fact, if you don't know anything or enough about your hardware, any software that you create for it is gonna be pretty weird, right? So have in mind what we're doing to the, to the ecosystem of our Earth by all of these latent, latent, latent you know, and, and blocking and inefficient pieces of software that we're writing and realize that we're producing a thousand X carbon dioxide overhead. And now I, I'm not just here totally to appeal to this side, but there are other factors than just performance and scalability to be aware of, okay? And um, so ultimately, we want to rework into a reactive system. This is what I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you briefly about the, the platform, the open source platform that I'm developing and, and we're building a team around this effort. It's called Vlingo. You can say Vlingo if you want to, but I say Vlingo um, seems to, I don't know, sound better. But, but we do support these actors as, as aggregates. We do support um, a reactive HTTP server, very lightweight. All this stuff is under a megabyte of code or right about a me megabyte of code right now um, in, in terms of you know, um, Java byte code. And um, uh, a lattice, which is basically a, a grid or you know, a compute grid that runs on top of, of clustering within the platform, which is also all reactive. And uh, Streams is being developed and should be released shortly. So I, you know, kick the tires, take a spin. It's at github.com slash vlingo, V-L-I-N-G-O. And um, well, I'm, I'm just about 50 seconds from end of time. Uh, I do have actually some books and t-shirts and stuff to give away, but so if you come to my AMA um, this afternoon at, is it 2.55? Yeah, I think, sure. something like that. So I, I, can, I can meet with you at 2.55.
Okay. Thanks a lot for your talk. Okay. Oh.